The 417 Gamers is a group of board, tabletop, and card gamers in the 417 area code. This is the podcast. This is the 417 Gamer Podcast, episode 15, the one with Christmas. (laughs) In this episode, Andrea and I discuss four games that we enjoyed from the month of November. In the topic of the week, we talk Christmas, some of our favorite things... That some things we can't live without for Christmas. You know, just Christmas it up. It's the end of the year. It's busy. It's kind of, we're shoving a topic in there. Forgive us. And then for the top seven, we're going to talk about the seven games we would, or maybe already are, giving as gifts. Games. Gaming gifts. Without further ado, let's get on with the 417 Gamer Podcast. Welcome to the 417 Gamer Podcast. My name is Rick. And I'm Andrea. In the four in the 417 Gamers, we talk about four games we enjoyed from the previous month. November was super busy. We had Very busy. So much stuff going on. We had family. We had life. But, but, we, but we still squeezed in some gaming. We did. Um, Andrea, you want to start this off? You want me to go? Um, I'll go. Um, I played, we we played a game Mm. that I had heard about many times, but I had never played it before. Um, Castles of, Castle of Mad King Ludwig. Mm -hmm. Had, had you played it before? I played it a long time ago and the, we played this on Black Friday game day Mm -hmm. and we had a friend come out and she played one of our games and we appreciated it. Well, I'll probably talk about that next, but... One of her friends got the new collector's edition, so he sold his older copy to her, and she was more than happy to try and break it in and get it played. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, I am curious now what the difference is between the original version we played and the new collector's edition, Um, so I'd be interested in playing that next. Um, But I really enjoyed it. I heard about it for years. I guess I just never made it to our table. Um, So many games. So many games. I enjoyed the the theme of it. Mm-hmm. Um, you're obviously building a castle. Uh, every round, new tiles will come out. The tiles are rooms. And you'll um, line them up for rooms that you've already placed in your castle. You have to match up the doorways. Uh, I actually struggled with that a little bit because... Not all tile pieces will fit together. No. Um, some of the ones I really wanted and could afford money-wise didn't fit. The The doorways didn't uh, line up. So, uh, but I still feel like I made a beautiful castle. Um, thematic, too. Very thematic. You had I, stores that went down to a dungeon that then you had a bottomless pit. I did. It was perfect because you have, you have to get stairs if you're going to pick downstairs room tiles um, because you can't have an upstairs room and a downstairs room on the same level if connected by a hallway they have to be stairs and you have to buy those separate and we i went down to my dungeon and off the dungeon there was a fungi growing room oh yeah i forgot your fungi room and then at the end the bottomless pit it's where we throw all the trash right (laughs) and you know the the fungi you don't want to eat right exactly So I really enjoyed it. I think that had this been a game in our collection, we probably would have pulled it out a little more often um, than some of the other games that we have. Um, So I wouldn't mind adding it to our collection. Ooh, okay. Uh, This is published by Bezier Games and designed by Ted Allspock. This came out in 2014. And yes, very much like it. In the game, somebody is the master builder. They set the prices of the tiles. Mm -hmm. And when everybody buys tiles, they pay the master builder. And then the master builder, whatever is left, he can buy from that, and he has to pay that back to the bank. Or you can pass and take an income. But um, you get points based on the buildings that you've placed into your uh, castle. Mm -hmm. You have a secret in-game scoring condition for yourself. As well as there's some global bonuses that everybody's trying to get. You know, you maybe you're trying to get the most blue buildings, or you're trying to get the most square footage of brown rooms, the rec rooms. Right. But very fun, very interactive. If I'm not mistaken, a lot of people don't care for this at two, or maybe it doesn't play two. I can understand that. Definitely, we played it at four. Yes, and four was great. Yeah, I, w- I definitely think um, three to. 
Is, I don't know. Does it play five? Supposedly it plays one to four on the base, and then there are expansions, yes. Yeah. Which is the collector's edition adds expansions in there as far as an extra player, more content, and all that stuff. Very nice. So yeah. that was uh, Castles of Bud King Ludwig. Very enjoyed it. The other game we played at Black Friday Game Day is Kepler 3042. This is a space exploration game, and it's kind of dubbed a 3X. Twilight Imperium, Eclipse, and some other games are dubbed 4X, and that is Expand, Explore, Exterminate, and Exploit. Well, in Kepler, you're not attacking each other, so there's no exterminating each other, which... For some people, they'll be sad, and I get that, <laughs> but I like the pacing of it. I like the resource management of it. Mm -hmm. When you start your board, you have nine action spaces you can take. Your cube starts in the very middle, and then every round, kind of like a uh, scythe, you have to move your action selector to a different spot than it already was, mm -hmm. and that could be getting you energy getting you other resources, upping your technology, moving your ships through the galaxy, uh, terraforming planets or colonizing planets, mm -hmm. then terraforming the right. planets. In addition to that, the, all the actions are in a... It's, it's nine squares of actions, and they're in a three-by-three three grid. There's also, further off the board, bonus actions. So you can take those bonus actions as long as they're in the row and column where your cube is to take your action. But you have three types of resources you're managing. You're managing energy, matter, and antimatter. To take a bonus action, you have to kick one of the energies or one of those resources that you could potentially use mm -hmm. to the, the pit. And it's got a... a the, the, it's like a, a black... Pit. Like, it's like a black hole. Yeah. It's gone forever. You can't get it back. There, there, there are some special cards that may come out, and there's some special effects to where you might be able to get it back out, but mm. it's hard. Yeah. So you want to make sure if you're taking a bonus action, you're using that bonus action well. Now this thing, it says 60, 60 to 120 minutes, and we played this at 3, and I think we were probably an hour, hour and a half. Yeah, on the upper end. And but it was our first time, so we had questions. We had to look up rules. Yeah, there was a couple ish, 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 iffy rules that I still liked the pacing of it. I still liked the restrictiveness of the actions because you know what you want to do. Mm -hmm. But to get there, you have to get your turns or organized correctly. Right. And I forget how many turns there are because there's a finite amount of turns. Yes. And at, at the end of the game, you, you're just done. Uh, this is designed by uh, Simone Sirta Sola, and this is published by Renegade Games in the U.S. Andrea, what did you think of Kepler 3042? Um, I enjoyed it. Um, we had a, a good player experience. Um, it was more, you're all, you're all doing your own thing, but it, there was still player interaction, which I enjoyed. Uh, I, I think that it wasn't as thematic of a game as I would have enjoyed, although I do like my sci-fi space games. You do. Um, so that had my interest. Um, I think that I would I would play it again, um, but I think I enjoyed Castles a little more. Um, it was a little more thematic for me. Now, as far as thematic, do you think adding some themed player pieces to that game would help the thematic? So if we threw in... A um, Enterprise and maybe a Star Destroyer and the Firefly ship. Do you think that would help the thematic a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think it would have. Uh -huh. um, it, it was, it was to me, it felt very Euro. Yeah. Um, so I, I enjoyed watching you play because you got the sparkle in your eye that you do with all those <laughs> resource management euros. I moved a cube to get some cubes to go to a spot, and then I moved my little wooden ship, which I understand if, I think, if we had some of the micro machines, little ships like we've gotten for, uh, what was, Wormholes, Wormholes. by AEG, mm -hmm. and maybe we take those ships back out. And just hold them off because now we have two or three spaceship games yeah. that they could be used in. Yes. And I think this is one of them. But that is Kepler3042, published by Renegade Games. Mm -hmm. Andrea, one more game you played in November. 
Um, well, like we said, we didn't play a lot of, we didn't get enough games played. No. Um, one of the ones that I liked that we played was Underwater Cities. Mm-hmm. It was, it was interesting. We had, I had never played anything like it before. There, there was a lot going on in this game. Yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of resource management, a lot of. Uh, I don't even know what you'd call it. Wasn't that just, it wasn't, there was card management. There was, um, placement. It was a little bit of everything. There were really nice pieces to this game. There were little like domes Mm -hmm. that you'd put over your city. Um, some were clear, some were colored. Those were worth more points at the end of the game. Um, A lot of this game had to do with what cards you were able to draw and get. You could, you had a finite number of reoccurring cards. Some cards were one-offs that you could play one time and then put in the discard. Um, It was very, very interesting. You're not all playing on the same board. Um, You each have your own little um, planet that you're trying to terraform you're trying to get resources to to get your city going the and it, it takes quite a bit of resources to get you going i think that it was our first time to play it so i was a little in over my head i had a lot of questions because there was so much going on um different aspects of it um but yeah i would definitely play it again it was Uh, it was interactive because you've got a general board that every turn different uh, cards flip up and you put your worker out there and you're hoping someone doesn't take the thing that you want uh, with like most worker placement games. And whenever you place your worker out there, there were three different color regions where you place your workers, the green area, the red area, the orange area, or Mm -hmm. maybe it was yellow. Whatever. Uh, there's three different areas you placed your workers to take actions. When you took those actions, um, you had to discard a card. And when you discard the card, sometimes you got to um, just take the action. Mm-hmm. But if the color matched the the color of the card that you discarded that matched the place where you played, you got to do both. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that was taking the action on the card. Sometimes that was adding your card to your tableau of um, income for end of round or uh, a trigger mm-hmm. ability. Sometimes it was in the game scoring. Yeah. I did like that there was one place on the board that if someone else had taken the thing you had to have, you could go there and you could still get the thing. You just didn't get the bonus. Right. Um, and you so, had to pay, I think you had to pay a little thing to get it too. Yeah. But that was nice because you didn't get completely hosed. Um, but yeah, it was uh, definitely not a lightweight game. No. Um, a lot going on here. But if you like the, the resource management, worker placement, space games, you'll definitely enjoy this one. And this is uh, published by Rio Grande Games, designed by Vladimir Succi. So I, I guess I was in a theme of, of space games, because uh, these, actually, all three of these last games we're talking about were off of our unplayed shelf. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the, the Med Clean Lugwood was not on ours. All the other three were on our pile of possibilities. Yes. The last one is Sovereign Skies. Sovereign Skies is published by Deepwater Games and is designed by Aaron Andrew Wilson. In Sovereign Skies, we're all I think we're all humans. Uh, we're we're trying to establish our Earth faction in the new cluster. Basically, we've we've exhausted the resources of Earth. Surprise, yes. surprise. Yes. So we're all going out to this new system, and on your turn, you have to move your ship around the board. And the board is made up of six tiles that are modular, so that it'll change the order every every time. And then when you're there, you can take one, two, or three actions. One action could be dropping off some pods, so you can maybe settle it later. A second action would be taking the planet's action. Each planet had its own ability. Like, mm-hmm. one would let you build. One would let you get resources. One would let you get monies. Mm-hmm. One would let you go to the Galactic Council. Yeah. Then the third action was take the card 
of that planet. So basically, you've you've uh, kind of brokered a deal or or got some ambassadorship mm-hmm. to that that planet in that system. Yeah. I really liked it. We played it at four players, and it says thirty to sixty minutes. And I think we played it in about a, an hour twenty because mm-hmm. that was with. A teach, and I think in the middle of it, somebody, I think they put in an order to the, the sub shop next yeah. <laughs> door. I think they went and got it. Right. And on Thursday nights, we're all coming to game night right, right after work. work. Yeah. So, understood. Mm-hmm. You know, so when somebody's got their sub order, we take a pause, you go yeah. get your sub, and we can go back to playing. Mm-hmm. I like the speed of it. I like the weight of it. And this was a game that I picked up because of... Well, oh, one of the podcasts I listened to. Mm-hmm. I think I liked it better than Kepler. Um, both uh, very similar, you know, like you said, thematic resource management, you know. Yeah. Um, this one, we're all moving around the same board with our little spaceships. Um, you, One of your actions, if you need to turn around and go back the other way, that costs you uh, one of your um, turns or movement uh, actions. Um, but I liked it. We're all going around the same, uh, we're all circling around the same cluster. I liked it. I think that it was a bit easier than Kepler. Yes. Um, so I caught on a little bit faster. Um, a lot of these games that we play are, we only play them once. Yeah. And then we decide whether we're going to keep them or not. This year it's been that way. Yeah. And a lot of these games that we've gotten off our pile of possibilities are our unplayed shelf. Mm-hmm. We're going to revisit next year and, get, and dive into it a little bit more. Right. But at the start of the year when we made our New Year's resolutions, I was looking at our shelf and we were like 39, 40. Mm-hmm. And as we were going through the shelf, I found more games that I hadn't logged on to Board Game Geek. So they were unplayed and not logged. And I'm like, oh, we got to add this. And. <laughs> Um, by the end of the year, there were 49. Mm-hmm. We started the year with 49 unplayed games. That's including, I think we had four pre-orders. Mm-hmm. They were already pre-ordered. Yeah. And the original idea was we were going to try and force ourselves to play these games before we bought more. Right. But life started happening. Mm-hmm. And we, we, we like our hobby. We like to have fun with it. That's right. And there were so many good games that came out this year. Yeah. We just had to... Eh, I'll fudge a little bit. Well, we, we made an executive decision. We still wanted to keep with playing the shelf. Mm-hmm. We wanted the shelf down to single digits by the end of the year, which yeah. we're darn close. As yeah, of this are. recording, I think we've got three games to get it down to single digits. Yeah. I would like to see us eat into that a little bit even more. Sure. And maybe finish, I think finishing it up next year is absolutely doable. Oh, and, yeah, completely doable. But I don't know, maybe, maybe we try another challenge next year. Who knows? <laughs> but... Those are the four games we enjoyed from the month of November. That was Castles of Mad King Ludwig, Kepler 3042, Underwater Cities, and Sovereign Skies. Let's get on to the one in the 417 Gamers. Hey guys, you hear me and Andrea talk about all the games we play out here on the podcast. Are you in the 417 area and want to come out and play some games? Well, head on over to Facebook at facebook.com forward slash 417 Gamers. Click the sign up tab, it'll take you to the group. You'll find out where we play all these sweet games. Go to 417 Gamers on Facebook. The one in the 417 Gamer Podcast is our topic of the month. And Andrea and I are talking Christmas. It's December. I'm a December baby. I love Christmas. I love cold. I love Christmas songs. I love Christmas lights. Um, in the expansion, we're going to talk about seven foods... That we love from Christmas. And maybe the, the, the holiday doesn't feel right without having them. Mm-hmm. But Christmas I love because I've got family that kind of lives out. I mean, not not terribly far away, but they're a state and a half to two states away. Yeah. And every Christmas the Bagwells come together and the Roses come together generally. And we have our, our Christmas holidays. Yeah. That's where I get a lot of my gaming from. Is the Bagwells get together every Christmas and we play card games and board games and party mm-hmm. games. Yeah. But and, and and the food. I mean, that's the Thanksgiving and the, the Christmas. Lots of eating. Of course. But it's also being around the ones you love and seeing the, the Christmas lights. Mm-hmm. And uh uh we've got a lot of Christmas themed stuff we're doing this December. We do. More more than we have in the past, actually. Yeah. I think 
So we got I'm Geekmas uh-huh. that we just got done as of this recording. Mm-hmm. That was uh, put on by Hawk Holman and Fanatic and the Fans. They did it at the Fairbanks, and I wasn't aware of the location, but I think they used the the location really effectively. Oh yeah, the they had um, the vendor hall, of course. The they had two rooms: an electronic gaming room and a regular board gaming room, and they were separate. And they were both really full. Yeah. Um, and good space too. Big large rooms they're old classrooms it's the fairbanks elementary on on the um it's on broadway Mm -hmm. in in, uh, springfield missouri yeah and then the vendor hall was in what was used to be the gymnasium yeah the cafe gymatorium yeah (laughs) but no it was it was a good space it was a good time lots of gaming um i really enjoyed it they did i've he knocked it out of the park i think and then my uncle does his christmas lights bagwell lights Mm -hmm. so if you ever buy the battlefield mall just off of battlefield and Stuart and Lester, the other two streets you'll come off a of battlefield to go on to. Um, he's got some new songs. He's got some new light patterns. He's mm-hmm. got some new lights. He gets new stuff every year. Of course. Go out and see him. Yeah. That's a tradition. Uh, we're going up to Kansas City to see. Um, it's they've got Enchanted. A, the Enchanted Forest Lights. Yeah. Um, it's a, like a traveling exhibit. Um, where it's, it's a huge just Christmas walkthrough display. It's going to be beautiful. Um, we'll give you more information when we get back about how wonderful it was. Yeah. But I, the, the pictures look amazing. Um, and then, of course, uh, playing games with our loved ones. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that your family is the first family that really, when we get together for you know holidays and such, that they really do get into playing the games. And I think it's a really good way to get people to interact with each other who might not normally. Yeah. Usually, you know, people get their plate, they split up, you go talk to the people you normally talk to. Mm-hmm. Um, and everybody goes off in their separate ways. But this one kind of brings everybody together and you're all interacting as one. So it's, it's fun. And, and my my mom and my aunts really like to play bigger party games if we can to get everybody involved. Yes. I kind of like breaking people up, playing <laughs> something a little more strategic, but I get what they're coming from. Yeah. When you only see somebody once or twice a year, you yeah. want it's limited interaction time, get everybody doing the same thing. Yep. So if we can play a big game, boys versus girls or yeah. you know, couples or whatever, right? It, it's a fun time. Uh, Christmas movies. I mean, I, I, I you know... Making my dad take me to go see Home Alone 1 and 2, which <laughs> he didn't really want to go to the first one, but he did. And we all we both enjoyed it. And then the second one, we, we were both ready to go see that. Yeah. Um, everybody has their favorite Christmas movies. Mm-hmm. Doesn't feel like Christmas unless I've watched the original cartoon Grinch. Yeah. And uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the original Burl Ives. Yeah. Um... I need to see one of the action movies. Doesn't have to be Die Hard. Doesn't have to be Batman Returns or Long Kiss Goodnight. Lethal but Weapon. I need, yeah, Lethal Weapon. But I need to see one of them. Yeah. Um, TBS killed Christmas Story, but that used to be another one too. You read Ready BB Gun? Had to yes. see that. But you see it every year so much to where I'm like, if I go a, a year without seeing it, I'm okay. Charlie Brown Christmas. Oh, yeah. I've got to see part of it. But. And I love that um, KGBX is our local um, radio station that plays. They've started playing started Christmas music right after. Yeah, yeah, right after Halloween, which I'm not sure. That might be a little bit early, but it's fine. But one of the songs that they play is from the Charlie Brown Christmas. And I'm always driving along and I always did it. Always peps me up, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> you know, They're doing a little dancing while you're while you're driving. Yeah, so that's always fun. Always helps get you in the spirit. Yep. And then we need to go to the Japanese Stroll Garden because they have their Christmas lights up. We're going to try and do that on one of these weekdays coming up because yeah. our weekends are packed. That's true, and the weather this week is supposed to be halfway decent. Yeah. So maybe we sneak that in Tuesday night. Sure, let's do it. But and then uh, some of the sporting events. I know it's it's closer to the New Year's, but we have the Blue and Gold Tournament with all mm-hmm. the local high schools and out of out of the area high schools that come in for mm-hmm. the Pink and White and the Blue and Gold Tournament. It's usually at the John Q. Hammonds and well, it's the Great Southern Arena now. Yes, but um, it's it's always 
a good time for those that like their sports. Mm-hmm. Don't blame them. Yeah. I grew up liking college basketball and, and going and watching the Missouri State Bears, which was SMS at that time. Right. Watching Spoonhauer and Coach Offord yeah. coach the Bears, and then you just the get your hopes dashed when they don't make the NCAA <laughs> tournament, but Aww. you get over it. But yeah, I do love Christmas in the Ozarks, and I'd like to see... I don't know. I, I like to see snow around that weekend it doesn't have to be on christmas Mm -hmm. itself but just hearing christmas songs and having some snow along with it just makes it feel appropriate get the warm fuzzies yeah and but i don't want it to be warm and fuzzy outside (laughs) right (laughs) only on the inside but what what are some things that just make christmas for you um you will probably laugh at me, but we went to the Dollar Tree today. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, the Dollar Tree has got some good Christmas decorations for a very reasonable price. Yeah, and, and I all- send you a whole bunch of hacks here and there and that like feed into your Dollar Tree addiction. That's true. But listen, I could... For a hundred dollars, I could de- trick out this whole house with <laughs> with Christmas decorations. With like seventy five items. Yeah, exactly. Um, but no, I that always uh, gets me. If I'm having a bad day, a little trip to the Dollar Tree, you know, always perks me up a little bit. Um, Christmas lights, driving around, wa- looking mm-hmm. at the Christmas lights, um, always uh, puts me in the Christmas spirit. Um, and like we were talking about earlier, certain songs, mm-hmm. you know, come on the radio. You're like. Mm, yeah, put a little little pep in your and we had a a, a senior dog that we we um, got from rescue one last year and he went on the christmas light one <laughs> rides with us because he yeah. loved car rides and we might have to continue that uh tradition with our new pup yeah yeah we lost our our dog this year along with a lot of other family but yes. we've made some new families mr berries are what is he, uh, five months now? Mm-hmm. Five-month-old Bernie's Mountain Dog? Yes. BMD? Yeah, BMD. <laughs> <laughs> he's a bundle of energy when we get home, and he's a good time. And But he's a good boy. He is a good boy. And so far, he's he enjoys the rides. Although, whenever we get a pup cup, he has some of the, the stinkiest uh, gas. I, I've never had a lactose intolerant dog before. <laughs> But we have now. Oh, he tolerates it just fine. <laughs> it's us that has the toleration <laughs> yeah, problem. We cannot tolerate that gas. <laughs> Holy. <sighs> and it just, and they're not loud. Every once in a while, he'll have one that has audibility, but it's, you can smell it when he's had it and like, wow. And he's a pup now, but he's going to be a big dog. He yeah. is. Um, he's got so, huge paws. Yeah. So we'll see. Yep. And you got him a gingerbread stuffed animal to play with i did when you first got it the stuffed animal was too big for him and what four weeks three weeks that we've had him now he's grown up enough to where he can start shaking it around and have a good time with him yeah he is um i I swear we can see him growing yeah it's crazy i want him to say a little baby (laughs) there's some other stuff in the area we still need to do there's Um, always a lot of the christmas shows down in branson um, I have a long time ago, we went to the Dixie Stampede for the Christmas show. Mm-hmm. And, but that's been, gosh, 10, 12 years ago. I wouldn't mind doing that again. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are, we went to Silver Dollar City, um, because this is the last year for Fire in the Hole. Yeah. Well, the old Fire in the Hole, they're tearing down, they're building a new one, but we had to go have one last ride on the, on the old Fire in the Hole. And they had some of their Christmas up, lights up when we went. Not the whole; it wasn't completely done. They were getting ready. They, yeah. Um, so that was that was fun. Um, Branson's not terribly uh, terribly far. No, and um, there's a lot of good places to go see lights, mm-hmm. and they decorate the 76 Boulevard really nice. Yeah, a lot of Christmas um, shows down there. Ozark, down by the Finley River. They usually do a light display that you drive through. That's the, a really good time. Yeah, the park. Yep. Um, it's a little drive through. I think it's just donation only. Last year um, was donation only, and I hate to say that it is or isn't this year. Right. But um, so that and that was fun. Um, and then usually, uh, not only the news leader but the uh, Sp- uh, Springfield Citizen, both of the newspapers, print and online, usually have a uh, a map 
for Springfield, Nixa, Ozark, and I think now Republic of some of the lights to go look for. Right. Some really great um, people, just yeah. regular folks getting their houses all decorated up like your uncle. But no, that's some of the stuff we're looking forward to for the, the Christmas season. And um, without further ado, let's go into the seven. The seven and the four with seven gamers for this episode is seven games that we would consider giving as gifts. Yes. Our, our list will be slightly different yeah. Uh, because the people that I'm giving gifts to, my friends and family, aren't as heavy of gamers as yours. Yeah. Um, so mine will be a little bit lighter weight. Um, but still, I think we've got a, a pretty good list going on here. So let's start with, uh, these aren't necessarily in any order. These are seven games we just kind of, so let's, number seven for me is Dixit. Dixit is a party style game that is published by Asmodee. Uh, it plays three to six. I really think you should play four to six. Mm -hmm. You have these cards that have like surrealist art on there. And on your turn, you have a storyteller. The storyteller picks one of their cards and says something about their card and puts it face down. Then every other player finds a card in their hand that close as close as they can match what you just said. So like Alice in Wonderland or Falling Forever. Or you can just make a sound. <laughs> you can do as much or as little as you want on your card and everybody puts it in. Yeah. Then the storyteller shuffles them up and reveals them in or, or well just reveals them and says mm -hmm. the, the clue over and over. So Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland. Then everybody except for the storyteller have numbers of one through six. And they'll put the number out who, of what card they think is the storyteller's. If the storyteller, if nobody can guess the storyteller's uh, card, he gets no points. If everybody can guess the storyteller's card, he or she gets no points. The storyteller only gets points if he if he or she can get a chunk of the people. So you want to be close enough that some people get it, but not so on spot nose. on that everybody gets it. Yeah, you don't want to... This is a person holding a watch, walking down the stairs... Right. ...that looks tall on the top side and fat on the feet side. Yeah. Then everybody's like, oh, it's right there! Right. No, you, you want to kind of, you know, uh, uh, fencing. Or yes. the knight... Something a lot, you know, something generic ish. Yes. But not so generic because some of these cards will have similar things that you can find. Mm -hmm. You know, there might be a knight with a sword and there might be a rabbit that has uh, a knight's nice helmet on and there might yeah. be a suit of armor in a hallway and all these could have been played in the same way. Or you could have meant night like darkness and yeah. stars and moons. and. But as lo if, if the storyteller gets some. And the, the people that got it, they all get points. Now, in the case where the storyteller got everybody to guess theirs, everybody gets points for guessing the storytellers and they mm -hmm. get nothing. Yeah. And then everybody that has a card that got picked that wasn't the storyteller, mm -hmm. they get points for that as well. Yeah. I, I like it because um, after a quick teach, every single genre of gamer from light to heavy can play it. Andrea, you're number seven. Marvel Remix. I, it's a, a deck of cards, basically. It's a card playing game. And each card has a character. It could be um, the one of the Avengers. It could be a mutant. Mm -hmm. um, it has, you know, Professor X in there. You are trying to get a group of cards together that will make you the most points. For example, if you can get Thor and Thor's hammer together in the same hand when it's time to score you'll get more points um you have to have there are also villains in the deck as well and you are required to have at least one villain and one hero at scoring time yep. um in order otherwise you don't get any points so you are trying to build your set of cards that play well off of each other and at the end of everyone can either draw a card face down or if you have a card that you don't want, when you discard it, it goes face up in the middle of the table and everyone gets to see what it is. Yeah. And if I'm trying to collect Avengers and you are trying to collect mutants and you discard an Avenger, I can pick it up 
and then I'll discard something. I don't, that does me no good at all, but it might be the perfect card for you so you can pick it up. Or if nothing that is face up works for you, you can draw a blind for face down. It is helpful if you have the scoring app because it can be a little bit confusing adding up your points at the very end. Um, but it's a good time. Because some cards can cancel other cards. Right. Which they say blank. And blank Blanks means takes takes away its effect. Mm-hmm. So very fun game. And this, I, I like this pick from you because it's the let's go again. It mm-hmm. plays quick. Very quick. So it plays. So on your turn, you're going to draw a card and then discard a card. Mm-hmm. And you can either draw from the face down decks, or you can draw from the face up pile tableau that's been that that builds throughout the game. Yeah. Once there's a tenth card discarded to the tableau, the game is over. Right. So it only plays in about twenty, maybe thirty minutes if you're playing with six players. Right. But as soon as it's done, everybody adds it up. You have a, you know, especially for people's first game, like oh now I know what's going on. Let's go again. Right. And at twenty minutes, let's go again. Heck yeah, it's a great gift. Number six, Andrea, what is your number six? (laughs) Mine's a little bit bigger game, uh, Lords of Waterdeep. Mm -hmm. I think this is a great interactive game. It's uh, very Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Um, They are, you have a, a, it's quite a large board. Um, It's worker placement um, where you're trying to collect resources to fulfill your cards that you have for points. They're called quest cards quest cards Mm -hmm. um so you may need uh, a certain number of clerics and uh i (laughs) clerics rogues fighters yeah a certain number of each um to be able to fulfill and as soon as you get enough to fulfill your quest you can turn it in at the end of your turn and get a new and you can draw a new quest. Um, there are entry cards that you can draw and play that are either give you a, a bonus of some sort or some of them are mandatory quests that you play on other players and they have to fulfill that mandatory quest before they can turn in any of their other quest cards for points. So it kind of slows them down. It's kind of a dick move. It is. But if there's someone who's just running away with the game, they're going yes. they're someone's going to play those on them to help balance out the board. It's really enjoyable. I would play this anytime, anywhere. And I think that anyone would enjoy getting in it as a gift. And then that sets you up for the next Christmas to give them the, the expansion, the uh, Scoundrels of Skullport. Yes. Because I like Lords of Waterdeep up to four, but I don't like it at the full five. Yeah. And if you like, if you have a, a group that you get together that you have five enough, mm-hmm. I think you absolutely need Scoundrels of Skullport because it adds the extra areas to go to, and it makes five bearable to, to enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Six goes back to being dicey because Scoundrels of Skullport does add a sixth player, which only in special cases would I play six. But five, I will play as long as we all kind of know what's going on. But Agreed. Uh, my number six is My City. This is published by Cosmo. This is a Reiner Knizia game. This is a game that has a forever game on one side. And on the opposite side is a legacy game. Mm-hmm. And it took us, what, two and a half years to play with our friends, Alan and Sarah? Only because we didn't get to meet up very much. No, because we, we started that game right before shutdown. Mm-hmm. And then we had to wait until everybody, you know, was on the same page and, and kept our circle small. And, yeah. You know, we had family members that were kind of immunocompromised, and so did they. Mm-hmm. So we got to a point where we could play, play through the whole campaign, and it's one of my favorite gaming experiences. Yes, there are Tetris like two point. <laughs> there are Tetris like tiles that you're placing onto your city. Um, there's one person who draws a tile, and then everyone has to place that same tile. Um, you're trying to um, each on the legacy version. Each time you play, there are different things. Yep. Either you're putting, trying to get gold mines, or you're trying to lay down. Uh, certain types of cities or uh, buildings together uh, surround a church with certain different color buildings and such. Doing a factory district, starting the railroad, yeah. cutting down timber. Yeah, it was really fun. I really liked the the, th- 
there's a storyline to it. It's a loose story, but mm-hmm. it's there. Yeah. It's basically untapped, you know, uh, wilderness-ish. You start building some rough buildings and getting mm-hmm. some points, and the church comes in there. You add that in. Then you have a sawmill that starts cutting down trees, and you get more building types. And as you um, your board comes with trees on it, and you, there are stickers that you put on your board. Um, so at the end of the legacy, everyone's board is going to be different with different stickers on it. Yep. And it's, it's really cute. Yep, it's a very fun game. Brings us to five. Five for me is Point Salad. Mm-hmm. This takes the place for, for me for what Andrea's Marvel Remix does. Yeah. This is an easy game to teach. This is a fun game. I have, This plays two to six. Love playing this with families. It plays in about 20 minutes, and this is another one of those one more time games. Mm-hmm. As soon as you're done, quite a few people during the holidays, family are like, oh, that one's, that was easy. Yeah. Let's go again. It's intimidating whenever they see some of the games you play, especially if they watch you through Facebook or, Mm -hmm. you know, have seen some of the games that you played earlier in the day. Like, oh, that's really complicated. There's a lot of pieces there. Yeah, "Yeah, it is. But once you get playing, it's not that bad. So you pull out, you know, Point City. Like, I don't know if I could play this. You run them through it one time. They're like, ooh, okay, I I understand this. Let's do it again. Yeah, absolutely. You're getting points for making a salad. Yeah. You've got, uh, there are requirement cards that'll say, you know, you get this many points if you have the most carrots or for every set of cabbage and onion, you get this many points. Um, so, and then you're just trying to pick up the cards to fulfill your salad requirement. So, and that's published by AEG games. And there's like three designers on this one. So I'm not, I'm going to say it's a design team and it's published by AEG. Mm -hmm. Andrea, you're number five. Uh, trekking through history. Yeah. Um, we did this at a, a play to win at Geekway. Yes. And we won the play to win. And I'm glad we did because it is, it's very, uh, a lot of my friends watch Doctor Who. So it has that, that theme to it. Um, the, there are three stacks of cards that are different portions of history. Some of them go back to like, you know, 35,000 BC with dinosaurs on them. Um, Each turn, there are three rounds. In each round, you have a clock um, that goes from 1 to 12. And as you go around the clock, every card that you choose, you'll have to spend a different amount of hours there. It might be one hour to go uh, see Caesar, or it might be three hours to go see the finishing the Great Wall, or, you know, going to see Marie Antoinette. This takes two hours. And you have a total of 12 to go around. There are modifications you can get we call it a time stone, but it's a, a little jewel that you get. You can knock an hour off your time, so you have more time to use somewhere else. Mm-hmm. It's a really interesting game. Um, the cards themselves are really interesting of all the different things. All the major points through history have a card um, that you can choose, like, you know, see Martin Luther King's speech or, yep. you know. Uh, it, it's really interesting. So, um I think for a young adult, this would be a great game. Um, help them learn, you know, the major points of history, um, as well as, you know, time management. It was really interesting. I liked it. Yeah, we really liked this one. We recommended it to quite a few friends. Mm-hmm. That was number five. So number four, Andrea. Uh, patchwork. If if uh, It's only a two-player game, but we played the heck out of it. And I would definitely give it as a gift to someone, to a couple um, even if only one of them was a gamer, you know, anyone, it's their Tetris style pieces. You're uh, building uh, a quilt, um, which is why it's called patchwork. Mm-hmm. And, and you have buttons that uh, are points or money or your currencies, Both. Uh, buttons. And each Tetris piece that you pick up is either. It's worth so many buttons and so many time. Your scoring board that is in the middle, um, I'm not sure exactly how many spaces there are. Um, 
start to finish. I don't know uh, offhand, but... But it goes pretty quickly. It's a 20, 30-minute game. Yeah. Um, and we have several different variations of this game. There's a we Christmas... have six copies. The only one we're missing, to my knowledge, is Valentine's Day. Yeah, we've got the Christmas, the Halloween, uh, the Americana, the Fourth of July. They all have different The theme. Korean folklore, and I think the China folklore edition. Yeah. So, but it's really cute. I definitely recommend it. It'd make a good gift. These are all fairly, you know, it, it's a good price point for a gift. And fairly easily easy to find. There's yes. there's a couple. I think we each have one that's probably a little pricey. Mm. But um, my number four is Downforce. This is published by uh, Restoration Games. This is a take off of an old racing game in the eighties, and I think it's. I don't remember what the, the old game was. But in this game, you are you you start off auctioning off cars. And everybody will own at least one. They may own two. And then you're going to play the game. On your turn, you're going to play a card. And the card has multiple cars with numbers. And that tells you how many spaces you're going to move those cars around the track. Mm-hmm. And as you're going around the board, the racetrack... Once a car passes the first black line, everybody picks up their little sheet of paper and puts a bet down. And it's just a check mark next to the car that you think is going to finish the best at the end of the game. Mm-hmm. Then there's a second bet line, you do it again. Then there's a third bet line, and you do it again. And you play until either all the cars have finished or uh, nobody has cards left. That means the cars the cars have sputtered out in the track and cannot make it. They ran out of gas. They did. Uh, so you are going to get money for where your car that you purchased finished. Add it to how you did on your bets during the game. And you're going to subtract how much you spent on your car at the start of the game. And that's your, that's your score. Mm-hmm. Whoever has the most money wins. I think this plays really, really well. Uh, this is uh, I want, once again, this is Dixit. This is three to six. Yeah, I, I think it technically plays two, but three to six is where you should play this. There's also some people that have uh, got the Monopoly had a game called Monopoly Gamer Mario, and they had Mario Karts. Mm-hmm. If you bought those and the expansion cards, a lot of people have reprinted the uh, tiles to where you can play with Mario Kart cars. Well, that's cute. But yeah, Downforce is really fun. You can get the the original box, which is nice, heavy components, heavy boards. Or there's also a retail edition that you can find at the, the box stores that has kind of cheaper cars, a thinner board, and it's a cheaper price point, mm-hmm. which I don't blame you for either one of those. Sure. Plays the same either it way. It does. Number three is Monikers. Uh, this is the party game I suggest to my friends that like uh, Cards Against Humanity. Yeah. Cards Against Humanity is is fine for those that really want to play it. By all means. I'm, I'm not telling you not to. Mm-hmm. But Monikers feels like a game. It's not just who can make the nastiest thing. <sighs> right. Or it's a popularity contest of... Uh, oh, I know this person. They're gonna. They're, they'll know what this is, right. and it's it, it's that the whole time. Mm-hmm. Monikers. It doesn't matter if I know you or not. We're gonna play this game, and by the end, we're probably gonna know quite a bit about each <laughs> other. In Monikers, it's it's a take off the um, open license game celebrity. You have a stack of cards, and they're all people or potentially actions or. Um, places Mm -hmm. and you take a you play at least three rounds the first round you pick out the card and you get your team to guess it and you can just read most of the cards have a description Mm -hmm. you know um this was the russian leader uh during blah 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 blah. they're all or this this president played the saxophone to get elected in the 90s yeah Stuff like that. And then there's some adult themes in there, too, which I'm not going to go into. And you can call this game down to make it more family-friendly. Sure. And there's a more family-friendly game already called Time's Up. But we have enough friends in our group that like to go towards the the dirtier end 
They want to play something like Cards Against Humanity. And Moniker satisfies that. Mm-hmm. I can play it with them, or I can pull out the, the naughty cards, yeah. and we can play it with family. Right. Lots of laughs either way. Very much lots of laughs. Number three for you, Andrea. Uh, Azul. I think Azul would make a good gift for anyone who doesn't have Great it already. Puzzle game. Uh, it's a good puzzle game. The tile pieces, they're little ceramic tile. They look like Starburst pieces. They they do. Shiny but they're, Starburst. They're good heavy pieces. Uh, they got a good feel. Um, I think uh, it's a good starter weight game um, that everyone should have in their collection. Um, if someone doesn't have it, I, I recommend it because even if they're a heavier gamer, they're going to have friends and family who are going to come over and not be able to jump right into the, uh, the scythe or the, uh, twilight Imperium. Um, I recommend every, everyone having it on their shelves, uh, for friends and family. Number two, we both went the, the, the deeper strategy game. We did. Andrea, what is your number two? Uh, my number two is Ark Nova. Uh, it's definitely a heavier game. Yeah. It's going to be a more expensive game. Yeah. Um, but if you, if you really like that person, if you really like that person and they enjoy gaming, you are building a zoo. Um, it is, it's really, really interesting and fun. Um, we have played it from two to four player. Um, we played it at, I think it'll go to five now that the, not yet. Not yet. There's a new expansion out that adds an aquarium to your zoo um, with um, fish and sharks. And um, and it is called Marine Worlds, mm. Ark Nova expansion, which we just bought it. And it adds um, little fish pieces. Um, there are a, you have new tile pieces that you put on your board that will are for the aquarium um there's little penguins it yeah, the I, player pieces are now themed yeah i really like that about this it gives you um for the um the university there are a bunch of new university um pieces that go on the board um we've really enjoyed adding the expansion to ours but just the base game i because uh, we I w- kept on looking at etsy and etsy has some really cool stuff to add mm-hmm. to it yeah but when we saw this expansion we're like oh let's hold back and see how nice these are very nice so you get new trackers now you mm-hmm. have a, a ticket shape thing that tracks your tickets mm-hmm. you have a uh victory cup that tracks your uh oh your uh, conservation uh, points yes and then you have a cap that, you know, your prestige amongst the uh-huh. universities. And in addition, instead of having just the little cubes on your player board for your, uh, whenever you do the conservation projects uh-huh. and invest and all that stuff, they're now animal shaped. So yellow has monkeys, um, blue has the fish, black has the penguins. And red's red. a little wolf or yeah, coyote. it's a wolf or or some type of yeah. I think it is. I think you're right. I, I was gonna say meerkat, but I think you saved me and yeah. you said wolf. So <laughs> I was gonna say meerkat, and I'm probably wrong. But yeah, for a deeper game, if you have a friend that loves the games and they don't have Ark Nova, and, and you don't mind spending some money mm-hmm. on them because you loves them, or if they already have Ark Nova, get them the Marine expansion. Yeah, we Marine really Worlds. really like it. We do. For me, number two. Uh, the strategy game that I would get people right now, it's the one that I'm hot on, is uh, White Castle. This is published by Devere Games. The This is the same team that designed Red Cathedral. And we like Red Cathedral quite a bit. As far as strategy games go, I like my games that are a little bit on the tighter side as far as economy and actions. Mm-hmm. And this is a game that you're going to have nine turns. And you're going to try and squeeze as much out of your nine turns as you can, and then the game's over. Now, this is a game that if you have friends that are AP prone, like analysis paralysis, there's so many things they can do, but they just lock up, maybe not for them. Yeah. But if you like your, if you have your friends that love to look at the board and strategize how to best play their action, this is for them. I love this game, and... I think we might be getting it for a friend for Christmas. But that's, <laughs> It'd be a good gift. Yeah, this is White Castle. 
Which brings us to number one. Number one for me is Scout. I don't know how many times we've pulled this out and played it when we're waiting on in the middle of other games. Mm -hmm. We pulled this out last year for Christmas. Also, whenever we were playing with... um, yeah, several different couples. Yeah, uh, several different couples, several different types of then game we days. got it. Yeah. I mean, it's a just... Keith and Mel, mm-hmm. she got it. Um, Don and his played sister. It with Don and his sister, he got it. Mm-hmm. We played it with Alan and his wife. I think he got him a copy. Yeah. Every it, time we play Scout, somebody else gets it. Yeah, it fits so many. It's just a quick little card game, um, kind of like your Point Salad or your Marvel Remix. Um, it's um, it's a trick taking ladder climbing game. Yes, exactly, and it fits into so many different genres with so many different groups of people. At if even the heavier gamers enjoy yeah. it, um, so yeah, great gift. And then your number one. My number one is Marvel Splendor. Yeah. And I, because I would give this to anyone who is, well, superhero movies are so popular right now. Uh, the Marvel universe, so popular. Um, and as, and I know I've said this before, but Splendor is a great game. Marvel Splendor, better. Yep. So if it takes a really, really good game design and puts just enough theme on it to where, you know what? I, I don't know. I don't think I'm winning. I'm not, you know, I don't know exactly if I'm doing this right. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to put Spider-Man, Spider-Ham, and Scarlet Spider together. Yeah. Why? Spiders. <laughs> I'm going to get Gamora, Drax, and Star-Lord together. Why? They're in the galaxy. Right. We took this to, um, well, we've taken it to so, so many game days, um, so many conventions. Uh, we have. It goes over really good, especially at the um, the Comic Con type conventions, because um, everyone's familiar with this franchise. Um, so you see the cards, uh, the the uh, you're collecting the Infinity Stones. Um, oh, it's just so it would make a really good gift for a gamer or just someone who is a fan of this franchise. Those were the seven games that we would potentially give as gifts as of this year mm-hmm. for the 417 Gamers. Uh, we'll see you again on the 20th where uh, we'll talk about four things that we've either enjoyed or are looking forward to in the 417 area. Our topic of the week, we reviewed Ori Calcum. Did we like it? I don't know. You have to stay tuned. <laughs> the seven. We'll talk about seven things that it doesn't quite feel like Christmas unless we've had it. Yes. And then we may have just a little bonus at the end. How will we know? I don't know. You have to listen. Okay. But we'll see that on the December 20th. But until then, we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. The 417 Gamer Podcast was recorded and produced by Rick Bagwell and Andrea Smith. The music we use, Kind, Gentle, Beautiful Person, and Making Up for Lost Time was created by Origami Reptica. For links to the music and our show notes, head over to our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash hobby gaming network. If you would like to game in the 417, head over to Facebook to facebook.com forward slash forward seven gamers. Click the join. You get to the group and see all of the great times we have and all the places we play. But until then, keep gaming in the 417.